Welcome everyone to episode 3 of Popcorn Peeps, the podcast in which we venture through the top 100 films of all time, according to Hollywood Reporter. My name is Jordan Costa, but before we get into things today, I'd like to go over a couple housekeeping items. So Popcorn Peeps is now available on a plethora of other podcasting platforms. Previously we were just on YouTube, but now you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. So while you should still subscribe to the YouTube channel, there are plenty of other listening options for you now on the go. I'd also like to encourage our listeners to leave some comments on the YouTube videos because I see the numbers and I know you're listening, so let us know what you think of the films and if you have any criticisms of the show. We are always looking to improve our product and your feedback is greatly appreciated. But without further ado, we've got some fucking rats in here! Is it you, Sarah Alexander? Oh my god. Are you the rat? <laughs> is it you, Chris McMullen? Are you the fucking rat? For all I know, it's you that's a rat. You know, George's throwing a lot of uh, blame around here. He's sounding pretty sus to Craig me. Moore, you're the fucking rat. I think you're mixing your genres. <laughs> that was the whole opening of the film, is uh, Mr. Buscemi calling everyone a fucking rat with his, uh, his Brooklyn accent. The whole opening of the film was him on a rant about tipping. Are you not introducing us these week, this week, Jordan, as your co-hosts? Or I just introduced you as the fucking rats. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'll know my place better. <laughs> so Reservoir Dogs is a crime film written and directed by Quentin Tarantino, starring Harvey Keitel, Tim Roth, Chris Penn, Steve Buscemi, Lawrence Tierney, Michael Madsen, and Quentin Tarantino himself. Interestingly enough, he played Mr. Brown, if you were curious. The film released in 1992, and it was his first film uh, produced independently. Uh, we've got two of his films on the list. We've got Pulp Fiction sitting way up at number five and Reservoir Dogs sitting way down at number 98. So uh, before we dive into Reservoir Dogs specifically, I'm kind of curious as to what you guys think of Tarantino as a filmmaker. Quentin Tarantino is one of my favorite producers and directors of all time. I love his work. But you haven't seen Reservoir Dogs yet? And this is, so when I told my wife I hadn't seen Reservoir Dogs, she, she kind of just sat there and looked at me with this look of bewilderment on her face. Like, you haven't seen Reservoir Dogs? You haven't seen it? That's how I feel every week with you guys, though. <laughs> she didn't know who she was married to. In my defense, I didn't see it either. No, I haven't seen it either. I also haven't seen Pulp Fiction. Holy shit. I cannot wait till we get to Pulp Fiction. I do like Inglorious Bastards. I have seen that. Kill Bill, I, I have seen those volumes, but those just never stuck with me for some reason. I can take them or leave them. Um, but I, I did like Reservoir Dogs. Good opening number from Tarantino to have this one be your first film. Yeah, what a great one out of the gate, huh? And he kept going too. Like, I love, 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 love Tarantino. I might have seen this in the theater when it came out. Oh, I was too. I was negative too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Tarantino is a really divisive figure for me because while I love some of his works, I think I'm pretty lukewarm on some of the other ones. It's very hit and miss. Like Django Unchained was one of my favorite films of that time in filmmaking and I really enjoyed it. But a couple years prior, I had watched Inglorious Bastards and it just wasn't for me. I think I might have been a bit too young to appreciate it at the time. I watched it when it came out and I was probably just starting high school. So maybe didn't really have that much appreciation for the kind of unconventional storytelling that Tarantino is known for. Or maybe I was more into the uh, more formulaic type of stuff and I wasn't quite ready to pop out of the box quite yet. Yeah, you're too busy getting all excited about Iron Man and Thor. I love Iron Man. So Superheroes shooting colors out of their hands. It's weird. None of those made the list. Yeah, isn't that strange? I was really big into Avengers for the first probably five years that they were pumping out films. So maybe you've hit the nail on the head there, Craig. Yeah, you can like both. It's like the last 15 years of cinema, though. So it's not your I'm not saying it's your fault or you've made any bad decisions. I'm just saying that is what cinema has been for the last while. And that's what you were used to at that time. I am blaming you. <laughs> It'd be interesting for you to go back and kind of rewatch it now that you're a connoisseur, Jordan. True. I'm going to have to go back and watch Pulp Fiction as well because that was another one I saw when I was like 17 or 18 or so when I saw it. And it seems to top tons of lists, but it didn't really resonate with me that well. 
And actually, I kind of felt that way with this film. I can't argue that it isn't like a masterclass in acting and performance. I thought everyone did a tremendous job, but I think it's more so just not my style of film. Um, we'll talk about it a little later on, but there's some grotesque stuff that's happening. And while it is memorable and engaging and uh, it really makes you feel, it makes you feel disgusting. And I don't know if I like that. <laughs> it does? Okay, yes. It also makes me feel disgusting. I found this one was a lot less story driven, but more character driven. Like the characters were the whole story here whereas sometimes you'll have like an overarching like a war movie that's the story whereas this one it's literally just these four people yeah in this warehouse fighting it out i agree i would say it's like uh, it's a crime movie that's not about the crime yeah like the heist is never we never really see it it's just everyone's reaction to it and leading up to it what did you guys think in particular about the non-linear structure of the the storytelling did you feel like that was something that pulled you out of the experience or did you enjoy kind of um, a less conventional approach Tarantino's done that before in other well I say before um, no he has not done it before <laughs> since this was the first one but he does do that where he tells you the bit of the story to get you interested and then he tells you how that happened and i think i love that way of, of telling stories i love it in books i love it in movies i love it in video games i love it all the time me, me too a hundred percent i like it yeah when it's done well because then it's kind of like like for this one you just have mr orange crying in the back of the car after being shot it's like oh how did we get here like i want to know so then i liked going back to kind of piece it together but in a way that didn't really spoil anything like it kept you engaged throughout i i 100 got how he got shot I thought the nonlinear structure was a little bit jarring at first, but as the film continues and you kind of get into the flow of things, it becomes a lot more enjoyable. I particularly liked the flashback sequence with Mr. Orange. I thought that was really interesting. The one where he's talking to his um, handler? Yeah, because by that point, you're getting into more juicy details of the film. You know who the rat is, and you're really getting into the, the nuances as everything kind of comes into place and all of the, the big gaps, the big mysteries in the first half of the film start to kind of trickle into place. Yeah. So there is a way of telling the story with the flashbacks that was done very well where it gives you this uh interscene slide you know it says that you know mr white you know you're you're seeing the story of mr white you can also do that by just flashing back and forth i don't know if you guys have been watching the witcher on netflix yes, at, yes. when it came out but it does this back and forth through time in a very jarring way that's hard to keep track of what the actual flow and pattern of the story is and it actually when we finally get there you'll see pulp fiction has moments like that as well where where you're thinking wait who that wait doesn't he know this guy or these guys you know what are you are they just meeting for the first time but now we're halfway through the movie and it can be kind of confusing so i think in reservoir dogs they did a very good job helping us as the audience understand how he was telling the story mm -hmm. i totally agree and i think that's a fantastic example because for the first three episodes of the witcher i didn't know what the f was going so on confused. at all yeah I was so <laughs> Especially as someone who didn't play any of the games or read the original source material. I was super lost. I think that's a common sentiment amongst viewers. That was a good device, cause, especially because some characters don't age, so you really couldn't tell. But, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. So let's go in and let's look through some of the uh, important scenes chronologically. What did you guys think of that wacky kind of introductory sequence in the diner? I thought it was fun. I thought you kind of got a sense of who the people were and it was just a nice dynamic to have them all kind of riffing off of each other. I'd like to know how much of his stuff is scripted and how much of it he kind of just maybe gives them a formula. Like, okay, here's your benchmark you have to get here. Like Steve Buscemi's tipping, like could he just pull that out of his head or was that word for word what Tarantino put out? I think I may have been overly engaged in that just because I think Western tipping culture is really dumb and we should adopt a model where people can actually survive without random hospitality of clients. Yes, I <laughs> so I thought it was really interesting. How far in are we? Market for socialist comment. Love it. <laughs> We're at that point. Did we hit our 10 minutes? I'm allowed to talk about socialism now. <laughs> Chris talks about socialism whenever he wants. There's no stopping him. It's fine. That's right. I thought it was a really good way to introduce some of the characters in a very casual light, how they are riffing off of each other normally, because then you can compare that and see how they react once their plan has been foiled and once everyone's at each other's necks, how these people connect so casually together and then kind of the switch gets flipped and all of a sudden people are pointing guns at each other. People are believing like, oh, you scammed me. You sold me out to the police and they're ready to kill each other. 
I thought it was cool. I thought it was an interesting way to set up a sense of normalcy before diving into the kind yeah. of crazy chaos. But like nature. watching I them agree. in the diner, I thought they were all friends. Like I'd never seen the movie. I had no idea what the plot was and just the way they were interacting. I thought they knew each other. I had no idea this was their first heist. They didn't know each other's identities or anything. And then just to mark that kind of lighthearted scene with the next one is like Mr. Orange shot in the back. It was just kind of like, a, oh shit, like this isn't as fun as I thought it was. Yeah, I think he has a very good way of writing those kinds of scenes. He writes dialogue that is very easily identifiable as Tarantino dialogue, almost as much as Sorkin writes dialogue. When you watch an Aaron Sorkin TV show or movie, you know this is an Aaron Sorkin. Like You can hear it. It's almost as if every subtitle should have a by Aaron Sorkin underneath of it. Pretend I'm an uncultured swine and don't know who Aaron Sorkin is. Newsroom on HBO? No, never heard Newsroom, of it. Newsroom, The Social Network, the that was the story about Facebook. Okay. So these guys, some of these writers, they have a way of writing that is so good and so identifiable that it the type of pattern rarely changes throughout the movies because if it ain't broke. It makes them seem really real. This sounds like a conversation that could happen outside of my office, mm -hmm. probably about mm -hmm. 3 o'clock while people are eating orange. Absolutely. And writing actual real dialogue that sounds like a kind of conversation real people would have yeah. is very difficult. Yes, it's seamless. I agree. And the contrast is interesting because then it sets up that moment Sarah said, where we then transition to the scene in the car and Mr. Orange is bleeding everywhere and being absolutely hysterical. And you're just kind of like, whoa, all right, what's going on now? Like we're, we're jumping right into it. Yeah. And I thought that scene was really well composed because the red blood on the white leather with the black suits... That was very visually striking. It was a good choice because if you've got black or tan leather seats, you don't get to see how grotesque mm -hmm. this gut mm -hmm. shot actually is. And I was so impressed with the scene right after that with Mr. Orange and Mr. White, where he's basically begging for his life. That felt so emotional and so raw. That was probably mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts of the whole film. It's just the interaction between those two asking like, hold me tight, please. I won't say anything. Uh, bring me to the hospital. I won't rat any of you guys out. Just like the raw emotion of a, a man begging for his life willing to do and say anything he can to, to not meet his end there yeah do you reframe that later once you actually know who mr orange is i don't think so because it was really interesting of course he's gonna be like i promise not to rat you out but he's the cop yeah of course he's gonna lie it's the delivery just the dark horror in his voice that i it gives it such an emotional punch but he's lying i didn't know that tim roth was a cutie back in the 90s i was there for that <laughs> no no comment i didn't realize where i had seen him before but he was the villain in the 2008 incredible hulk film when i like clicked in halfway through oh. the film <laughs> jordan you're the best i think i i would agree and one of the interesting things is i was on, i follow some writers on twitter and one of them had said just a couple of days before I watched this movie, how come you never see people in films die in a believable way? They always just get stabbed by a sword, gasp, and then fall to their knees, and that's it. Or just go out with some cool guy movie quote. And while I was watching Mr. Orange on his back crying and dying and begging Mr. White to take him to the hospital, you know, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I was thinking, my God, that's probably how I would react to getting shot in this stomach please for the love of god get me to a doctor i don't want to die i'm afraid to die and then they have like six scenes afterwards where he's just like keeled over in the background and they're just going about <laughs> their day yeah. I thought that was so strange slowly bleeding out i i don't know how truthful it is that it is a slow way to die like i know for sure you will but like when mr white was explaining it, he's like no 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 you have hours like, i don't think so i think he was just trying to get him to calm down i feel like if they would have maybe put some pressure on the yeah. wound you would have had a chance to <laughs> to last hours but instead they just let him lie <laughs> yeah. there in a pool of his own blood slowly bleeding out and With no a one gun. was even thinking about like put a rag on him so i have to say when i i forgot who the rat was he wouldn't let go of his gun in that scene and I thought, what a liability, because he's kind of rolling all over it with his hand. I was like, he's going to shoot somebody. Right. Yeah. I love how he maintained his act. But there was a scene where these bank robber murderers are, oh, no, he's a good guy. He's not a bad guy. Like, from their yeah. perspective, the cops are the bad guys. And just the whole performance where he's like, the, he's going to die, sure, but he doesn't have to make the decision, do I go to prison for 10 years or 20, because he's going to walk away from this scot-free. 
Yeah, I thought the chemistry between Mr. Orange and Mr. White was uh, really interesting to watch. And then Mr. Pink comes in, and he becomes <laughs> the best character in the film. He's awesome. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Pink is far and away the best character of the whole film. Craig, this is a compliment to you. So you were Blanche last time. You are 100% Mr. Pink this time. I thought the same thing too. I played Among Us with Craig, and it's all about deducing who is the imposter amongst a group of people on this ship. And Craig is asking questions like he's Sherlock Holmes when we play this game, and Mr. Pink is not fooling around. That's Craig. Do you think that game is based off of this movie? Like with the colors and... I don't, oh, I don't think so. Shit, but Sarah. I'll tell you, orange is pretty fucking sus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have decoded it. I think it's probably inspired by it, but there's so many other kind of whodunits. There's a lot of tabletop games. There's, of course, Clue, which is like the classic whodunit. I think it's actually inspired by the movie. I think the movie's called The Thing, and it's these researchers oh, yes. in Antarctica, oh. and there's this shape-shifting creature that kills them and then takes on the form of the ones they kill and they try to figure out who is the thing i think that's what uh, inspired now we're now we're reviewing among us not <laughs> reservoir yeah. dogs but that's fair no i love mr pink especially the scene where he gets his name mr pink i thought that was really good too where they're all yeah. sitting in the room it's very serious and he's just like no i don't want to be mr pink what the fuck is that well, we'll then we'll trade no nobody's traded <laughs> I think it's the weird contrast between the, not, it's not slapstick, but it's like a dark humor, dark humor, just combined with the serious nature of the rest of the film that it bounces back and forth between that. It makes it really interesting. And some of the language, like in that scene where Mr. Pink gets his name and then they say a word and it's just weird seeing that. And like, there's other language throughout the movie too, that I'm always like, <sighs> when they would say it he, he does that i think it was probably easier to get away with that too in 1992 as opposed True. to 2020 where everyone is i guess much more cautious of what they say and they're much more careful not to offend people but then again i don't know probably mafia members in 2020 probably don't give a shit either probably so. not <laughs> it was still jarring back in the day there was another moment too where um there was this element of dark humor a kind of buried inside of this dangerous situation where mr orange and mr white are talking about the plan and they're going over it and mr white White's talking about how if he can't get the bank manager to calm down, he snaps a few fingers. And then after he's talking about snapping some fingers and punching him in the gut, he just goes, fuck, I want some tacos. The scene cuts yeah, right let's there. let's get the taco. Mm -hmm. yeah. mo moments like that that give it a sense of style. Agreed. It makes it more interesting as well because you realize at that moment, like, this is just a career criminal. This is Tuesday at work for him. He's, right. I'm going to go to work, and if the guy gives me a hard time, I'm going to break his fingers or I'll cut off his finger. And, uh, you know, I could go for some grub, maybe a beer. You want to... I felt bad for Mr. White until that flashback sequence where he just guns down two of the cops without any hesitation in the car as they're escaping. I'm like, no, you made me feel for you and you're a bad guy. I don't care about you anymore. So that made Mr. White's death ultimately a little more like uh, enjoy enjoyable as kind of disturbing as that sounds. I liked that he was able to do that, but then he took such issue with how Mr. Blonde was, I guess, a bit more cavalier in his killing. But then like, he wasn't he, a professional. We, we never see him kill anybody. But can we talk about how they're all trying to be professionals, despite the fact most of their interactions are the least professional thing I've ever seen? The most professional one of all of them was Mr. Pink. Just because you wear a suit doesn't mean you're a professional. Let's be clear here. <laughs> I think getting paid to do a job makes you a professional. Yeah. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, that's fair. I suppose so. I mean, I think Mr. Pink, he should have just taken off. He, if I were him, I wouldn't even stash the diamonds. I would have been in Mexico seeing yeah, nerds. I would have been long gone. <laughs> Good to know. What did you guys think of the, the infamous Mr. Blonde scene? Did you have to cover your eyes at all? The dancing one? Well, Mr. Blonde primarily has one sequence. He comes in. He's all cocky. He's got his soda in his hand because apparently he had enough time to stop it in and out on his way to the <laughs> freaking rendezvous mm -hmm. point. And he just kind of flicks it around and he's cocky and he's arrogant and he stands up for himself and as the rest of the people go get their diamonds he pulls out his trophy and starts messing them about before he meets his demise and he really only had one segment in the film i love that scene i like that scene as well i didn't have to look away because the camera did that for me yeah isn't so. that cool you're all yeah. psychopaths you cover your eyes that's spooky <laughs> 
So I th- loved that scene. I thought this whole scene did a great job of explaining to us without showing us what Mr. Blonde did in the jewelry store or the jewel store or whatever. It did a great job of explaining to us why Mr. Pink and Mr. White were so fucking on edge. Because yeah. this guy is a mental case. He's a butcher. He's my favorite. Of course he is. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually made a note on this so I wouldn't forget. The song in there? Stuck in the middle with you? It lets us you? feel... Stuck in the middle with you, yeah. That makes us... It lets us feel the glee that he has doing this. Right. Right. He's having a great time. That's a good point, Chris. Yeah. Oh, he's vibing. Yeah. He's doing a little his dance. dance. Oh, he's got his it. tune skis going. And it was pure style. You can't disregard that. That was well done. It was an excellent scene. Even when he goes out to his car, too, and then we know like the music does stop, and then you hear the street noises, which I thought was cool, and then it's only when he goes back in that it picks up again. It's just a nice... I don't know. I thought that was done well. That was really noticeable, too. Yeah, that was stylish as heck. Tarantino's soundtracks and sound design are amazing. He's really paying attention to that. Can you be really credited for your soundtracks if you just go steal popular songs and throw them in your movie? Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. If it's, well, and you know what? A lot of those songs were from the 70s stuff he would have grown up with, but they wouldn't have been popular again. They, some of them would have gone into obscurity, and he brought them back. All right. As a young Zoomer, I can't call you yeah. out on that, so I'll just have to the, believe the, you. Yeah, the reason, the reason that you think of them as popular songs is because he repopularized them. They would have been dead. I was reading that this film did have quite a small budget, but he spent a good chunk on it getting the rights to that song in particular because he really wanted that one. Well, he didn't need a lot of sets. No, <laughs> no it's like two sets in the whole film. I think that's like he couldn't afford a lot of sets. I think that's why you don't see the heist. You just see them running outside. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we need to see the heist. I think if we no. saw the heist, it would have taken away from the movie. Absolutely. You would lose the whole mystery element, right? That's what makes it really compelling. Absolutely. The, the, one of the scenes I really love too is the, it's a bathroom scene with orange and pink. And it really felt like I was standing beside the Bathroom scene with orange and with pink. With white and pink? White and pink, I'm sorry. With the, like the, be cool, man. Which no. is also... <laughs> Just be cool. The more of Tarantino movies you'll see, there's a bunch of stuff that is connected. Like that be cool mm. yeah, uh, is this in uh, Pulp Fiction. There's a scene where that's used over and over. Oh. That wasn't even the best we'll bathroom scene up. in the film. The best bathroom oh, scene was when Orange is taking a piss and there's the German Shepherd. Oh, the yeah, yeah. Saying, uh... His fake story flashback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was... Yeah, I was thinking about that one earlier, too. That one, you do get that same, like, being right there, but I just felt like I was in the room the way it was shot. It wasn't like a big block scene where you saw everything. It felt like I was standing beside them, and then I would shift angles, and there's a shot where uh, Harvey Keitel, Mr. White, is kind of out of frame, and you see his reflection in the screen, in the mirror. It's just fucking brilliant. Can we even call this a Tarantino film if there was no Samuel L. Jackson? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) However, I would like to say, because I don't think Jackson was in Kill Bill, right? He first appeared in Tarantino's works in Kill Bill Volume 2. No, he was in Pulp Fiction. He first appeared in Tarantino's works in Pulp Fiction and later on in Kill Bill Volume 2. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can edit that so you don't sound like a dumbass. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite part of the film... Ugh. I really liked Balan's line where he said they were talking about the status of Blue and they said he's either alive or he's dead or the cops got him or they don't which I just thought was like a really funny roundabout way of yeah. saying I don't no freaking <laughs> know I have no, no clue but it's like one of those things it's like we know what we know we don't know what we don't know some of the things we don't know we know we don't know mm-hmm. some of the things we don't know we know we don't know yeah. and it's it's a very definite way of explaining what the situation is because saying I don't know that doesn't lend any credibility to what the hell you're talking about. There's only four possibilities. I just don't care. Like, it, does, it doesn't yeah. impact me. We're here now. We need the diamonds. Maybe I'll torture this cop a little bit. Yeah. But the status of blue has no impact on me. Yeah, there's four scenarios, and none of them change what our situation is. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. carry on. I just think that's really, it's a kind of like a meme phrase, and I feel like I might pick that up and uh, start recycling that one oh. now. Good. Yeah, <laughs> good. I expect to see some. So, what was your favorite scene, Sarah? What did you like the most? 
Uh, one that made me laugh was when everyone's left is just the police officer and Mr. Orange and Mr. Orange wakes up and whatever and the police officer asks him how he looks. He's like, do I look okay? And I thought, you're asking this man who's dying on the ground for the last hour if you look okay. It just seemed a little preposterous to yeah. me. Like, okay, buddy. I, no, see, I would disagree with that. He was like a good looking guy and he was put together. I think that that would probably one be one of his major concerns. If he's like tied up in how good looking he is, yeah, and that's that really personalizes him to say, "All oh, like you're dying, but how do I look?" Yeah, that's what I got. And that's what I meant by preposterous. Like you're so conceited that you're oh, asking okay. this guy who has his guts laying out if you look okay, and all you're, you're just missing an ear. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Craig? What was your favorite part of the film? Yeah, so I actually, I loved Mr. White. I thought that the movie uh, really made us attach ourselves emotionally to Mr. White. And at the very end, when he basically threw everything away to protect I Mr. Know. Orange, and then Mr. Orange tells him, I'm a cop, and my, my heart broke for him. Of course, I knew ahead of time, because the movie tells you ahead of time. The movie tells you like halfway through. But the way Mr. White reacts when Mr. Orange tells him I'm a cop made me feel so much emotion for him my heart broke into a million pieces no Mr. White got exactly what was coming to him that was yeah. <laughs> they were both dumb assholes like just I'm sorry also that whole ending bit felt so inorganic I felt the whole movie was so believable up until the point where Mr. White this guy who has been causing trouble his entire life serious professional criminal goes and throws everything away for Mr. Orange. And I do get that they're trying to bank on the fact that Mr. Orange took the bullet when it could have been Mr. White. But I think someone who has done and gone through what Mr. White has gone through would have just cut his losses. And why would he throw everything away for something like that? A guy he had known for, let's say, like a couple weeks beforehand. But do we know that Mr. White's history is like murder related or is it just bank heists and that's what he was caught for? Like maybe this is the first time he's been in that situation. Yeah, I got the impression this is the first time Mr. White has ever been in a situation or anything like this. Throughout the movie, he was saying, I would never work with a guy like Mr. Blonde. I can't believe I got in on a job like this. This is a catastrophe. This is crazy. I think this is all brand new to him. And he's got this kid that it's like the kid's first job. And he was his partner kind of in the job. And he took a bullet for him. And he felt responsible for what was happening to Mr. Orange. Got played. This is a bit of a side note, but how do you feel that Mr. Orange shot that old lady in the head to steal her car, despite the fact that he's a cop? I think it was just a reaction because mm -hmm. she shot him and then he's a cop. That's what you're trained to do, right? I think so, too, but that felt really jarring. So is that one of the moments where when you're undercover, you're so deep that you've actually crossed the line? Like in your mind, you've become the criminal? Yeah. Maybe. I mean, yeah, you can justify it a hundred ways, but I still think it felt jarring. And I think he thought that after, because I think it was just a knee-jerk reaction, yep. how he reacted, and then you see his face after, and it's kind of like, whoa, shit. And he even said in, at one point, like, I can't believe she shot me, man. I didn't think she was going to shoot me yeah. or something like mm -hmm. that. Like, it clearly was in his head, like, holy shit, what did I just do? You don't mess with those old grannies. They're packing heat. Yeah, you're in the States. You put two in her chest before she opens the door. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Be a professional. <laughs> Does anyone have anything else they want to bring up? I liked that at the end, Mr. Orange like he was honest with Mr. White because the guy just stuck his neck out for him. And I think he could have easily kept his mouth shut for 60 more seconds and been fine. But just the fact that maybe he did appreciate that this guy had killed his boss and his boss's son and it felt a little bit of guilt there that he was like, by the way, I am a cop. Did you think the ending was good? I thought the ending was incredible, yeah. and personally, I love that the fate of Mr. Pink is left up to our imaginations. Personally, I like to think he got away. He did. Oh, I think so, we too. We hear him. He died. Personally, he, I he, like to think he got well, away. You're, you're wrong. <laughs> wait, what happened? Uh, he he died was shot and arrested. <laughs> he, he broke yeah. free. Yeah. Wait, wait, no, wait. He died. What happened? Pink no. died. You don't know that yeah. from watching the film, you do hear, you? You hear what? him. He's like, you shot me. Mr. Pink? Yeah, when he takes the diamonds and goes and you hear the police pull up, you hear like a shootout and you can hear him yelling. Oh, I didn't even realize that. I, I didn't hear anyone yell, you shot me. I just heard a bunch of guns getting shot. Well, go back and re-listen. <laughs> I swear I heard him. No, he's dead. He's They all died. Ah, uh, maybe he got shot in the gut and died 14 hours later because apparently that's how healthcare works in this movie. <laughs> Would the movie be better if he doesn't get shot and he just makes out like uh, gangbusters? I don't know. Probably not. Makes no difference to me. Yeah. 
And it's probably more poetic if they all die anyway. Yeah. So in terms of robbers, were you any more sympathetic to Bonnie and Clyde from last one versus this group of guys? Did you have any difference in opinions on how they operated? <sighs> These guys were so much more ruthless. And I don't know. How was the economy doing in 1992? Probably a little bit better than it was doing in 1930. It was fucking baller. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, you could have just gone and got a job at Blockbuster or something. Yeah. No, it, it was good. You were like, it's pre bubble baby. He could have just been like an assistant manager at a McDonald's and made some decent scratch. Yeah, life's not that bad. You have Space Invaders. Yeah, you could play. You could be playing your Nintendo. Yeah, you like, got Super Mario Brothers three. Life's way better in 1992 than it is in 1930. <laughs> the original Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy. 19, you had Star Control and Star Control. Not that it's particularly relevant, but I did feel that this film was a lot more emotionally charged and purely engaging than Bonnie and Clyde was. Bonnie and Clyde felt like you were watching a movie, where this felt much more like. Like, like Chris said, like, you feel yeah, like you're in yeah. the room there. I don't know if it's the way it's filmed or some sort of something to do with the composition or the quality of acting, but it really felt so much more immersive. Yes, I would agree. Just overall, the quality of storytelling and the ability to tell a good, coherent and cohesive story was better in Reservoir Dogs. And if this is number, what, 98, the next 97 movies are going to be incredible. Except for those Lord of the Rings ones. Hush. Oh, we have to watch Lord of the Rings? We have to oh watch Lord God. of the Rings. All of them? Uh, I think only two. I love them all. I love them all, too. All right, I'll get my napping blanket ready. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Sarah, where does Reservoir Dogs place in the global popcorn peeps hierarchy? For me, I'd put it as number one. Chris, where would you put it? Just barely, a bit like, number one. It's not like it blows away Bonnie and Clyde, but, like, Bonnie and Clyde are, like, one millimeter apart, and then, like, Seventh Samurai is out past the uh, orbit of Uranus. Are you going to dunk on that <laughs> film every episode? <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'm sure there will be other ones that are just as bad. All right, Craig. You've only seen two. Is Chris finished? Well, then allow me to retort. Uh-oh. Oh. Reservoir Dogs is so much better than Bonnie and Clyde. Ooh. It's like they can't even be measured by the same scale. I would put Bonnie and Clyde above Reservoir Dogs. Oh. I would put Reservoir Dogs in position number two, only for the fact that Reservoir Dogs is fucked up and I will never watch it again. I've seen it like five times. Is that just because of the violence, Jordan? You wouldn't... It's because of that ear thing. That, that messed me oh, up, Oh, that was... That was I'm so such a good. baby. You know what I loved about this movie? I loved that there was this whole mystery about who's the rat, who's the cop, who whatever, right? And even knowing the the answer to the mystery, like the solution to the puzzle, it's still worth watching again because that's not even the overall best part of the movie. Yeah, because it's about the characters. It doesn't matter that you know the, the ending. Exactly. I would argue that the mystery has little to do with my overall enjoyment of the film. I did like how the pieces kind of fell into place, but that was definitely not the, the selling point of the film, for sure. It was all about those characters and their interactions with each other and the quality acting. Having seen it like three or four times, I notice more things now. I notice when the, the take, and it wasn't break a finger, it was cut off a finger just so you're clear right the reaction on orange's face i didn't notice the first couple times he's appalled by that and he's trying to hide it interesting yeah i'm gonna have to go watch it again because i didn't notice that i'm sure there's tons of things you have to watch it more than once yeah the, the acting is Not amazing so if you're a real movie connoisseur you put it at number one but if you're a squeamish little baby you put that <laughs> at number two <laughs> I don't want to say snowflake, but... Go ahead. Don't censor yourself. Live your best life. No, you're you're fine. That's all right. Jordan does all the editing. He can just cut it out. That's right. You're not a snowflake, but you're <laughs> definitely not a... You don't identify with the same characters that I do. Yeah, you fucking like watching people get their ears sliced off, you, you sick didn't get fuck. get to see it. You don't see it. It wasn't even That's remotely. close enough. <laughs> Mr. White and Mr. Pink, I think, were the two best characters for me. I agree. Hard to agree. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Does anyone have any closing comments before we wrap up? Just, we will see a couple more, but it's really cool how Tarantino has a universe. Like Seymour Scagnetti has the same last name, and I believe is the brother of Jack Scagnetti from Natural Bone Killers. And you don't know it, or maybe you do, but Mr. Blonde is Vincent Vega's older brother in Pulp Fiction. Oh, okay, cool. That is interesting. I was disappointed that the cup wasn't from Big Kahuna Burger. Yeah, I actually looked when I saw it. I was like, oh, I wonder. No, nah, it wasn't. Marvel Cinematic Universe, move over. <laughs> All right. 
Where can people find you, Chris? Chris McZero at Instagram. Our Popcorn Peeps official Instagram. You can find my other channel, Anime Espresso, where I cover all things related to anime and manga. You can find me on Twitter at It's Jordan Costa for more memes and spicy takes. And if we want to plug our next film, does someone else know what it is? Airplane. No way. That's going to be interesting. I know nothing about airplanes, so going in, optimistic, open-minded. So something more lighthearted. I'm just waiting for the first scene in Airplane where someone gets their ear cut off and you guys just hated yeah. me. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> It's the opening scene. <laughs> you can stream it on Prime if you have a, the proper subscription, and you can rent it on Google Play, Microsoft, YouTube, Apple TV, and Amazon. Dope. Very cool. Well, thanks, Chris. Well, until next time, I hope you have a fantastic day, and we will see you next time. Rock on. Thank you. Bye. Bye, all. It has his guts laying out if you look okay, and all you're, you're Chris, just missing you... an ear. Can you lean a little closer to your microphone? You're just missing no, an ear. Oh. Oh, <laughs> my microphone's your here. microphone's on your head. <laughs> oh, that was that was incredible.